Um, first and foremost, audio all good and everything? Yeah, you sound great. Do I sound good? Yeah, you sound perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, as I was just telling you before we went live and everything, um, thank you for being here. This is, it's really, it's really not an interview. I know people like, that's kind of the closest thing I could say to it. Um, the other thing I kind of give, give homage to is like, I'm like, you know, I'm, I kind of emulate like Joe Rogan's style just in a very younger version of it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but I am my own person and everything. So, and then sometimes I like to say it's kind of philosophical in a sense, because usually at some point in the show, we get into some, whatever the deep topic is, whether it be something, we usually get into something to talk about. So I, I'm with it. I'm all about going deep in, uh, and, and, yeah. and testing the waters. It's good. It's rock. So without further ado, do you want to just introduce yourself to me and the, and the viewers? Because obviously we have never met before. This is our mm -hmm. first time having a conversation. Just introduce yourself. What do you do? Um, tell us about Hip Hop Science Show, everything like that, all right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, what's up, everybody? Thank you so much for having me, uh, Colin. It's dope to be on this podcast. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is uh, Maynard Okereke. I also go by the Hip Hop MD. And uh, I have a platform called Hip Hop Science, which is how I'm on this show right now. Uh, and really my platform uh, is a fusion of hip hop, pop culture, entertainment. I use them as tools to educate on various scientific subjects. I work right now as a science communicator. I have a degree in civil environmental engineering from the University in Washington. Go hogs, go dogs. Um, and uh, I worked as an engineer for a number of years in Seattle uh, with the engineering firm doing like uh, heavy infrastructure, stadiums, high rises, condominiums, uh, but I always had a passion for entertainment and music. Um, I'd always been an artist uh, working on music, producing, uh, writing, performing, and that was always a, a passion of mine. And uh, eventually some opportunities opened up and I left the engineering world and I moved down here to Los Angeles to pursue my entertainment aspirations, uh, acting and music. Um, and uh, really hip hop science came about because I really wanted to find a way to merge these two contrasting worlds that I was really intrinsically involved in and, uh, and then also find a way to give back. And so what I really try to do with my platform is encourage more minority and youth involvement into the STEM fields. And I use hip hop, pop culture, entertainment as ways to do that uh, and do a lot of social media content, a lot of creative content, my YouTube channel, obviously, my Instagram page. Um, and I work with organizations and schools and institutions, and I communicate cool different things that are going on in science. And uh, you know, some people call my platform kind of a fusion of uh, uh, World Star meets uh, Bill Nye in a way. So you know, if you want to call me the Black Bill Nye, you know, whatever, uh, run with that. Uh, but really, it's just making science cool, making science fun, and uh, bringing science to the masses in a whole different way. Definitely, man. That's I really think what you do is awesome um, because. I really like, I saw that in your bio, the Bill Nye meets, uh, yeah, the Bill Nye so, meets, yeah, yeah. I, w I was laughing about that because it, I, and then I was like, right as when I first contacted you, I saw the, um, the Bobby Shmurdo, uh video you posted. Yeah. And um, I think it's really cool that, not that science is making a, like a relap or whatever, because obviously every science has always been interesting, but like, we're seeing it become more popular with people, especially like, now that I've seen like podcasts really grow, people are really like wanting to listen to other people engage in deep conversations about really like things that they don't even understand. So I think yeah. it's cool that um, you don't necessarily have a podcast, but just you use hip hop science show to educate the young, um, like you said, minority groups too, to go into STEM fields. Like I think it's really cool because, you know, you can never be enough educated. And I think if education can be cool, then I think we should always push for something like that, you know? Yeah, for sure. hundred percent. And I think it's been, it's, it's been an interesting combination because you're right. It, do, it does seem, even from my perspective, because I've been doing this hip hop science platform for a few years now. And, uh, and I noticed primarily within this year, a lot of growth with my platform and a lot of attraction to the platform. And I think it's been an interesting combination with everything that's been going on, right? With social distancing and being quarantined uh, people have a lot more time to reflect and sit back and analyze their lives and kind of look at social media and what other people are doing and, 
and uh, think deeper and, and, and try to find ways to, or try to find new things to focus on or new things to accomplish. And science is one of those things where it's always been interesting, right? I think we've all had, at some point, we've all either loved like Bill Nye or Steve Irwin or, you know, all these other famous like kind of scientists that are doing stuff, you know, even National Geographic and Discovery. Those are things that have always kind of fascinated us in ways. But I think now we've had a little bit of time to really dive in and, and think deeper and, and, and have this craving for more science and more knowledge in a lot of ways. And I think that's why a lot of science communicators like myself right now are doing a lot of really cool things and science is kind of coming back to the forefront and people are really uh, interested in it. So I'm excited to see this next wave of this momentum grow and people to get more inspired by science, you know, even with things going on with the pandemic uh -huh. and, and you got scientists doing, uh, uh, you got you got you got scientists that focus on 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 virology and and viruses and things right now. Obviously, it pertains to a lot of things happening with the pandemic and even stuff like that is drawing inspiration. So it's really cool to see uh, to see this love for science really growing. I love it. Yeah, it's like you said, this whole social distance learning thing. I think you could you could go with it two ways. Uh, like one is like you know we miss the social and that will come back at some mm. point for kids and everything. We miss that social interactions, but also the technology it's really given like kids a platform i feel like not really a platform but it's it's given them the ability to, to seek out things that really interest them because like peer pressure is a real thing when you're a kid you know and so you do what your friends like to do and i think the cool thing about technology is you can't no one's sitting over your head telling you what youtube video you can and cannot watch or what instagram page you can and cannot follow mm -hmm. and as that brings flat earth theories and everything like that around, it also brings people who are really interested in black holes and things that are beyond um, really comprehension of the, of the, the youth mind. So I really do think that social distancing and, and really more technology, the way technology is going, it's, there's always negative effects, but I, I really think there are some positives that we can look at and see that there are things that, you know, I think people are being themselves more nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's really good because that creates innovation and creativity. And I'm a big positive person on creativity. I've made yeah. music uh, ever since I was in high school. And now I'm doing this podcast, which is like a creative kind of thought kind of thing. So yep. I'm really anything you want to do that's creative, that's not hurting someone else, you know, go for it. So I think especially what you're doing with science and everything, I think it's really cool. And you can wrap in education with it, like I said. Yeah, no, you're right. And I, and, and I think even with podcasts too, right? Because a lot of times people just look at podcasts as like, oh, this kind of media forum, people are just talking. But it's a, it's, a really, it's a really interesting creative outlet because, you know, yeah, lots of people have got podcasts, but it's just like any other entertainment medium, right? There, you got lots of music artists that are out there putting music out, but you gravitate towards what you like. You gravitate towards different styles that you like. And podcasts are really cool because you can, you can search for whatever field that you're interested in, right? It could be something science related. It could be something that has to deal with how to, or, or, or it could be something if you're into mental health and understanding yourself better, you have a wide variety of different podcasts that are out there. And, and that's the cool thing about it. Cause you could be creative. You could tap into different things that you're passionate about. And, and then you're able to connect with people that have that same interest too, and either bring them on your show as guests, like we're talking right now, or be able to now present what your you know thoughts are, what your interests are out to people that may have never even known that there was a podcast for that, you know? And I think that's the cool thing, you know, uh, with, especially with podcasts in all creative fields right now, is like you really have, no matter how, and I was telling my wife this too, even, even when you're thinking like out the box, right? There's some, everybody has different like, you know, little things that they have interest in or have desires in. And sometimes you might think that you're the only one, right? And you're like, there's nobody else that likes this, you know? And I've, I've like a crazy, I'm like a Cinnabon fiend, right? I love, I, I absolutely love Cinnabon. So I, it's just a weird affinity that I've had, right? So, and, but I might think that, oh, I'm the only one that loves Cinnabons like this. Tomorrow I might start a podcast about Cinnabons and, and when to eat Cinnabons. And, the right, and there, might be a, there might be thousands of people out there that have the same weird interest and in, in want to be involved with it. So I think that's the cool thing about being creative right now is you have the ability to reach people through social media, through podcasts, through other channels, and be able to create a whole community out of it, which is pretty dope. Definitely. Um, one of the cool things about uh, podcasting so there's there's like i said there's two routes to really podcast so there's the one that's like usually like you do your niche like you were talking about like cinnamons or 
um, engaging in whatever you usually an expert on, or maybe you're not an expert. You just want to talk about it. Maybe you're mm-hmm. reviewing films and stuff. So I've reviewed a couple people. I've, I mean, I've had a couple of people on guests where I haven't posted yet, but I had like a, he was a horror film podcast. And then the, the other guy who's just a film critic and I talked mm-hmm. to them and that's their niche. And so, and, and then there's the other people who like, just like to engage in creative thought and everything. And one of the things that I've seen is that people don't really like, when people are telling you to tour, tour, don't do something for podcasts. They're always like, they always tell me, especially because my show, not that it doesn't have any like specific niche, but it's like, I don't have anything that I'm really talking about every episode because my thing is I'm very social. I like to engage with all different types of people. I don't want to hold myself back yeah. because, because I like, I wouldn't have you on if I was just doing football or if I was just doing kicking or if I was just doing something, you know, specific. Mm-hmm. And I never want to hold myself back to And I really don't think anyone should. And that's not me taking anything away from people who have um, any creative endeavor that's like specific and has a niche. What I'm saying is I don't think that it's, it's right to tell people, even, especially kids that they can't do something that spans all different types. Because the thing about creative people that I've seen is that creative people tend to do a lots of creative things. They want to do what they want to do at a certain time. Mm-hmm. I heard this on uh, actually Joe Rogan's podcast earlier. He was talking about how like some stand up comedy, um, stand up comedians, how during the pandemic they aren't doing stand up comedy, but they're doing other things because like stand up comedy is kind of limited right now because of COVID. Yeah, and, and they can't sit down and be still because they're so creative. And I think you know we should just be like I said a couple conversations or I mean a couple uh, questions ago. We should really just be pushing creativity and doing what you want to do. And if you have something that you want to put out into the world that's positive, do it, you know? Yeah, for sure. And, and that's really the driver of, of innovation, too, is having more creative uh, thinking and, and outside the box thinking. And that's something I always preach in my platform, too, because there's always been this uh, mantra within education of how you either have to have a defined road, right? Like, it's like you go to school, you know what you, your, your degree and you kind of stay in that lane and, and, uh, and there's one kind of frame of how you get educated, you, you know, standardized tests and whatever, you know, and, and a lot of times those aren't really the best ways to not only engage students, but it's also not the best way to be able to stir interest. You know, if uh, if you go into a, if you walk into a classroom and you're learning some STEM field uh, for those of those STEM science, technology, engineering, mathematics, if you're learning one of those fields and you either have like a, a boring teacher or a teacher that just really goes by the book and they don't really bring any type of lesson plan that relates to like real life stuff or things that you can actually use or tangible things or scenarios. You, a lot of times you get people that just fall out of interest for it. Not necessarily that they don't care about the subject or care about what's being taught, but the way that you're teaching and the way you're presenting it, you're not thinking creatively. You're not presenting in a creative way that sparks that interest or gets that wheel spinning in a student's head, you know? And it's not like, oh, everybody necessarily needs to go into a science or have a scientific mind, but sometimes that creativity of just being a teacher, just presenting material in a new, interesting way can now re, you know, spark something that may have never been sparked before because of that connection that, that they were able to make, you know? And so creativity is important in all aspects, you know, not just uh, you going as an entrepreneur or doing some independent field, but in any field, in any type of educational format, having that creative element is always important because creativity is the crux of you being able to learn more and you wanting to be more curious about the world around you and things around you and engaging with people and asking questions, you know, and I always, always have this mantra in all my uh, videos. I have this little outtake, you know, people in their videos always have like a little outro verbiage that they say, my, my outro is always uh, curiosity is nature's PhD. Never stop asking. Right. And, and that really came about from, this thought process of, you know, you don't have to have a, a specific degree to con- consider yourself uh, an expert in this field or whatever. You just have to have a, a not only creative, but you have to have a curious mind. You have to ask questions and you learn more. A lot of the things I do right now in my platform isn't because I, I have a degree in, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, a rocket scientist or I haven't done, I didn't study material science engineering or I didn't study uh, 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 biology. But I have a curious mind and I investigate a lot of those. A lot of times I was telling you, if you go through my history on my on my browser, you know, FBI will probably come to my place right now with all the crazy things that I've looked up, you know. 
Uh, but it's just because I'm curious and I want to learn more. And I get into these like crazy wormholes of just learning more and absorbing more knowledge. And a lot of times you can uh, learn so much more about the world around you and end up diving into other different fields and other areas just by asking those questions. And you can be, become an expert. And that's the crazy thing about now having so much access to technology and different things around you and podcasts mm -hmm. and resources and tools and social media. You have so many different avenues that you can learn from. Definitely. I, uh, so I really do think teaching is the most underappreciated, um, yeah. uh, profession. Uh, and that's, I'm talking about teaching for like, obviously like kids, like the youth seniors in high school to kindergartners, even preschoolers, not really professors. Cause the kids want to be there, but teaching yeah. just because you can have a bad teacher. Everyone's had a bad teacher. You know? Oh yeah. And, we've all had bad teachers. Yeah. And Real we've all, teachers. yeah. And hopefully people have had, um, a good teacher. You know, I think I know I have. Um, so we know, we know where the cutoff is and we know what the, what the standard should be, but it's, it seems to be like, cause we, if you think in your mind, the best people fit should teach the youth, you know, we, we would think that, but it's become in a, I mean, I can't speak for other countries, but definitely for American society, it's been something that not that you, you do if you can't, but like you do that if it's, if you can't like it's almost like this um there's always this saying like uh, if you if you fail at something you teach it you know or whatever and mm -hmm. i and i think it there's something wrong with that because there should be people who want to teach kids you know yeah being teachers because it's so influential i remember i hated school and my mom always said i have like i had an iq and i was really smart and creative and everything but I hated school for so long. Um, like when I was a little kid, I had a really good teacher named Miss McGowan and she made me love and I was in gate and everything. Um, do you know what gate is? Uh, I've, I've heard about gate. What is this an acronym for something, right? It's gifted and talented education. I think it's just okay. like you take like an, I don't know. It's like a little kid IQ test. And then if you're yeah. uh, above this, you like do projects and stuff like that. Um, okay. solar energy. Yeah. It's just like, you know, just kids and just for kids and stuff. Um, it's basically what gets you into like a um, advanced learning and stuff. It's really yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's just something to be creative, really. Um, just because there's probably some kids in that who are going to be like rocket scientists, like you said, but there's also mm -hmm. some kids in there that's probably just going to, I don't know, drug deal, you know, you know, you never know. So, <laughs> All spectrums, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's really not, it's really not anything important, but like, I remember I hated school all through like middle school and everything, just cause like, not that that was all my teachers, but like, I didn't have the greatest teachers. And I remember what eighth grade, Mr. Hardy government, uh, I don't know if it was government or if it was, I think it was U S history, something, something in the social studies, but he yeah. made me love learning again, just the way he taught and everything. Mm. And then uh, my forensics teacher in high school and also my AP government teacher um, in high school, they made me really love learning again. And I think that's, the reason I'm doing politics or political science and philosophy and stuff like that. But we, there's something about a teacher who can just engage you through any subject. It doesn't matter if, cause there's something about people. If, if they're enthusiastic about something, you yeah. just feel more enthusiastic about it. It's yeah, that 100%. positivity vibe. And that's why I was watching your videos and like, you're so enthusiastic and not that theatrical, but just into what you're saying and you believe it. And it's, it's such a good feeling to watch people who are like that because there's, it's so easy to be the other end. It's so easy to be negative. It's so easy to be down and be like, Oh, this sucks. That sucks. But it's really hard to be super enthusiastic about something mm -hmm. unless you truly love it. So yeah teaching i truly believe we need to get the most enthusiastic people who really want to teach the youth yeah and it's crazy because i i remember i mentioned this in a uh in a, a virtual workshop that i did uh earlier this year and uh it's, it's right ties in right with the point that you brought up about passion right because and especially and this really goes with with the youth and, and kids primarily them thinking like k through 12 kids even at an early age can tell if you don't care about what it is that you're teaching to them you know and like a lot of times you don't give kids credit enough for how smart they are and just like you say you grew up not liking school like i grew up like i grew up having this love for school because i just love to i love to be social and be around people and you know I, I was always a goofball in the class right i was the type of kid that would get kicked out of class for laughing like too hard you know so like that, that was me right i had that type of energy but kids are always way smarter than we give them credit for and they could identify from a mile away if you are just 
going by the book and you don't want to be there. You don't have any care about what it is that you're teaching. You don't have a care if the students are actually walking away learning something. Students can really identify that in early age. And it ties in with, with really uh, showcasing what it is that you care about and making sure that the people that you're talking to and the students that you're talking to see that passion, they see that desire, and they feed off of that, you know? And it's like, you see, you see it in sports too, right? Like as, as an athlete, and I grew up uh, uh, playing soccer and I did, my main sport was track. I ran the mile and I ran uh, and the two mile and 800 uh, in, uh, in uh, high school and in college. And, uh, and so track's more of an individual sport, but you know, I did, I did soccer and everything as well too. In, in team sports, like you, you feed off each other, right? You feed off that energy. And it's the same thing in the classroom, right? If you don't have, you don't have a coach that's energetic and really uh, motivates, uh, that motivates the players, same thing. If you don't have a teacher that has that energy and motivates the students to wanna learn more or inspires them to ask questions or to think out the box, or it to be vulnerable, all these different things. You need that in the classroom. That's the that's where you shape your thoughts. That's where you shape your emotions, and you shape everything in your image about the world. And a lot of times, your desire to learn more and experience more is nourished by that teacher that you have in the classroom. If that teacher can't give you that, and that teacher doesn't portray that, then you immediately make that connection to the subject matter that you're learning. You make that connection to the teacher. And it's like, oh, they're teaching me biology and they don't care about it. Why should I care about biology? It's something that I shouldn't care about or whatever field, history, whatever subject matter. If that teacher doesn't embody that in, the, what, in what they're teaching, then you're not going to care about that. And you're going to make that instant connection. And it just takes one bad experience for that connection to just be gone and lost. You might not be able to recapture that, especially at a youth age. And so that's why it's so important. Like you said, teachers are so important. And it's so important to have the right teachers in the right positions with the right energy and the right care and passion to be the voices that are in the classroom teaching that because you need that energy. And you know, and, and I do that in my videos. Some people, I, it's funny because sometimes in my videos, people are like, why are you so crazy and animated and throwing your hands around and everything? And, it's, and a lot of times I don't even like, I don't even realize I'm doing it. This kind of is the way it's the way I talk naturally when I'm talking to you, like we're having a conversation. I'm just I'm moving around and I'm talking. It's just like that's just my energy. But a lot of times, especially when I'm like recording these videos, you see me here. This is usually where I do like my random like Science Friday videos or some of my TikTok videos that I put out. When I start talking to camera and I'm talking about something that's crazy. You, if you see like the edits or the outtakes in it afterwards, I'm just like laughing at myself. Like, this is crazy. This topic that I'm talking about doesn't make, is so outlandish. I'm like cracking myself up as I'm writing it or as I'm uh, uh, recording it, you know? And, and it's just because I care about it and I, and I wanna learn more and it's cool to me to piece it together and then share it with people. And you need more teachers, you need people around you, especially the youth, you need more people around you that have that type of energy. They're gonna not only convince you that what you're learning is substantial and is important, but also to inspire you to be able to wanna learn more too. Yeah, definitely. Uh... The one thing that you were talking about, how you're like, you're loud and you're like, and you're just do this and everything. Mm -hmm. Large personalities. I've always been told I have a large personality. Like mm -hmm. this past weekend, we just went to an escape room. It was me and my girlfriend, oh, yeah. and my brother, his girlfriend and my mm -hmm. sister and her, just her friend. Were you able to find, were you able to find one in the pain there? There was one that was open. Yeah. Well, I'm, I live in, for my family and I grew up in Vegas. So mm -hmm. there's things open. So there's oh, one Vegas, called es yeah. Escapeology. Um, yeah. So we went and it was a murder mystery, but it was the hardest one. Mm -hmm. And we we were nowhere close to finishing it by the time it was over. Cause you only get 60 <laughs> minutes, but it I was crazy. Yeah. I was moving and I was doing all the Viagra things and I was like, give us 30. I was, I was just being like, you just. And that's why your competitive juices in you too. Yeah. Right. Cause there's an athlete. You're just, we're just naturally competitive anyway. Yeah. Anything you do, it applies to everything outside of sports. <laughs> that, that is, that is interesting too. the competitive nature because people who I think of com competition and I think fun, you know, yeah. and there's some people, and I would say there's a good amount of people who, who don't really understand what competition is or even like really sports. And they don't, they attribute like bad things to competition. Like mm -hmm. I think, I think of competition, like I think of it as like engaging um, and it's just like good to like get out that energy. But there's a lot yeah. of people who like are afraid of competition. Oh yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, to each his own. Yeah. And, but going back to what you said a little bit ago about the, your mantra, um, one of the things that I always tell my girlfriend is the re one of the reasons I started this podcast on accident. I always say I accidentally <laughs> started this podcast, but I, I sometimes when I can't sleep at night, it's because I'm really just thinking about 
something that doesn't make sense to me and I can't figure it out. So I can't sleep and I, and my mind just keeps playing it over and over. And I'm like, I would say I'm, I'm kind of weird. I kind of flip flop. Like I wake up sometimes early and I'm like, I will have like a couple, maybe like a month or like three weeks or like two months where I'm waking up really early and I'm doing my thing. Um, but I also can get in grooves when I'm going to bed at one to 3 AM. Yeah. So it's just what's going on. But sometimes I will say this, if I, my girlfriend has this, her, her family's really big into vitamins and everything like that. So she has this vitamin combo that you take before you go to bed and gets you yeah. really into deep sleep real fast. Uh-huh. Um, but if I like, I'm just sitting there and if I have a thought, so say like sometimes I think very philosophically. So sometimes I'll think about like the big bang or something like that, something crazy. And I'll think about God and I'll think about how like to fit it in my mind will <laughs> just play it over and over again until yeah. I try to figure it out. And obviously I'm just a guy. So like, I, I can't really figure it out and my mind will be upset about that. And then what, what, what gets me even more is if I look up because what calms my mind is listening to other people talk about crazy things. So if I look up a podcast clip or something like that on YouTube, I can listen, I can about the subject that I'm freaking out about or whatever. It, it mm-hmm. can calm me down. But if I can't find one, then I like just toss and turn. And so I really like what you said about curiosity because th- there is really something about curious people that, not that they're really creative and not that they are really like smart or anything like that, but just that curiosity just str- like really pushes innovation, just everything in, in this world. And like, if you're curious about things, like, honestly, thank God for Google because like I would be lost. <laughs> Seriously. I think, I think the whole world, Google and YouTube, right? Yeah. Like between Google and YouTube, I, you don't know have many, I, how many things I fixed in this apartment because of YouTube or on my yeah. car. DIY. Like, how do you how do you do uh, how do you you know how do you stop a toilet from leaking or how do you you know fix the bumper of your car you know what whatever random things like I become an auto mechanic over here trying to <laughs> explore <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> All right. Well, now what I want to talk about is because you are a scientist and you entertain. I want if you can tell me what's the craziest thing that you know will blow my mind and you know will blow everyone's mind on here that you can just talk about right now or not even blow your mind, just something really crazy that you learned while doing the things you, um, the, your videos or just even in college or whatever, just, you know, go for it. It's like a, like a crazy science fact or whatever. Something like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, whatever you think when I say that, just whatever comes to mind. Yeah. Um, funny. Why I think that, I guess the first thing comes to mind is the most recent thing I, is the most recent thing I did. I just, I just, I just put out a video. I've, I've been doing this kind of science mystery series. It's only been like two videos so far, but it's like uh, kind of going into different scientific mysteries, right? Real life applications of things. And the first one was the one you saw with the Bobby Schmurders hat, right? It's like this crazy off the wall, you know, you know mystery that's like, uh, like a, a social media phenomenon. You know, obviously it's it's mostly social media hype. It's not doesn't necessarily have like a scientific correlation to it, but I find a way to be able to tie it in with science, right? It's always, um, I'm always about stretching the box, right? And thinking like, what if, what if, you know? And and that's how the whole Bobby Schmurder, what happened to Bobby Schmurder's hat uh, analogy came from. But the recent one that I just explored uh, had to do with uh, racial identification. And I released a video uh, that highlighted uh, the story of Rachel Dozal. For those that don't know, uh, she, she was a former uh, uh, chapter president of the NAACP in Washington State. Uh, she, she taught uh, at Eastern Washington University. She taught African-American history, African-American arts. She went to Howard University. Um, she had been living her life as a black woman. And then news came out that she wasn't black. She had been white the entire time. She had been white the entire time, right? And uh, it was this whole huge thing. That was like four years ago or something like that. Uh, but then a whole wave of that happened again just this year. There were like four different cases, of, and, and a lot of them were teachers, right? It was weird. A lot, I, I found that pretty interesting. A lot of them were teachers. Uh, there are two cases that happened this year. One, this lady that was a huge advocate for racial justice and different things like that, uh, uh, Satchel Cole was her name, and it came out in news reports that she had been misleading people and she actually was white the entire time and she had been claiming that she was black. And then there was another teacher that taught at, I think, Wisconsin University. Uh, that she was like of, of Irish heritage. 
and reports came out that she had been fronting as black and they had they put out all these apologies and stuff and apologized for you know misrepresentation and everything and it was just such the rachel dozal story was really interesting because it happened in like you know my home state and everything and there were a lot of stories of, of that happening but it brought up this whole crazy conversation about racial identification and what does it mean to be black because in the, all these cases each of them identified as black right but they're clearly just white individuals right and I thought it was just funny, especially now in this climate that we're, you know, talking about racial justice and different things like that. But I, you know, I wanted to find, you know, the, the science behind it, right? And 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 think like, what if, what, what? Because there's always an application, right? Of what scientifically could be happening in this scenario. And so I tied it back to a natural phenomenon in nature, which is biomimicry, right? Organisms that will uh, portray themselves as other organisms to ensure their survival. It's an evolutionary trait. Uh, that organisms will do. And there are different types of biomimicry that organisms uh, will exude in the natural world. And so I wanted to bring, you know, us as humans, we're part of the animal kingdom, we're part of the natural world, we're animals ourselves, uh, we're part of biology and nature. So all these things should apply to us as well, too. So I, so I tied in biomimicry to racial identification and proposed, you know, different theories of what type of mimicry that these women could have been uh, exemplifying in nature to and why they would be able to why they would want to portray themselves as black in those scenarios and so it goes really deep into like batesian mimicry locomotor mimicry uh malarian mimicry which are all different forms of mimicry uh for different purposes and different species and it was crazy because i got into this whole wormhole of like especially like batesian mimicry of finding like organisms that like use mimicry to like the craziest extent. So there's this like, cat, there's this sphinx moth caterpillar that can actually resemble a, a, a pit viper. And it portrays itself as a pit viper. And you look at the images, you look at the pictures and you're like, this is a pit viper, but it's an, actually a caterpillar. And it's crazy, it uses that as a defense mechanism to protect itself in the wild. And so I made all these crazy analogies to it. And that, that, that one just comes off my head just cause I literally just put that video out yesterday and uh, we had a whole, I did a whole live thing on my IG yesterday uh, with a good friend of mine uh, who, uh, who was really in depth in black history and everything that we just had crazy conversations about identification and social climate and racial constructs and what do we define as blackness and who can identify or who can claim they're black and you know it's all from a fun level you know it's, we got deep but it's uh but it's one of those things where you can get deep with it because i like to you know, I, I like to think deeply when you come to those topics too because it's conversations that we all need to have uh yeah. but i made that connection to science and i thought that was really dope i thought that that learning a little bit more about that was pretty interesting to me well it makes me think about how just like the topic of biomimicry and everything like how people would try to mimic their surroundings just in certain like social situations just to fit in and mm -hmm. like evolutionary that'd be so you stay alive and so like the pack doesn't just get rid of you and you just don't die by wolves you know yeah, so like exactly. it makes sense it makes sense to want to fit in like wanting to fit in is not does it makes sense evolutionary like especially mm -hmm. like when you look at like like kids like oh all of them are playing there's three boys who are playing football and one of their one of the other guys wants to be their friend closest thing to do you play football and then yep. all of a sudden now you're in the nfl and you're like why am I even playing this? You know, <laughs> and you go back to it and it's biomimicry or, or mm -hmm. something like that. So yeah, that's wild though. I think I, as soon as you started talking about the Rachel case, I think I remember who that is, but that's yeah. so funny because like, why, like, why <laughs> do that? Like, why do that? like I'm, I'm like 0.1% North African. I did the 23 me. I'm not going to yeah. go around telling people I'm black. Like, <laughs> no, don't do that. It, it was funny. I have one of my one of my friends. He's black, but he um he did he did the uh uh I forget the I forget there's a, there's a there's another one that's specifically for your African heritage, right? He wanted mm -hmm. to figure out exactly what tribe he came from. And for me, I'm I'm half Nigerian, half Cameroonian, right? So um and I was I was raised in Cameroon when I was younger. My my mom, you know, born and raised in Cameroon. I have family in Cameroon. My dad's Nigerian, so I'm like I know my. I know my lineage, right? I know exactly where my family, where my roots and everything came from. And uh, when my friend did this, he found out he found out that his uh, heritage was, was uh, Nigerian. And he called me, he's like, hey, 
I'm not j- <laughs> but it's cool for us right in the black community right because we're all we all have African roots from somewhere it's just you know over time obviously through you know through uh, the slavery and everything like that just got washed out we don't know a lot the African Americans don't know their history so it's always cool to have something to identify with right we, we, it's, it's human nature we all want to know where we came from and and our homeland and identify with our people. And that's for all races, you know, if you're white and you wanna know like, oh, am I Irish? And you know, am I Swedish? You know, like what European country do I come from? Or if you're Latino, like understanding like, you know, uh, uh, what Latin country you're from. Uh, so it's, it's intrinsic with everybody. You all, we, we all have a, a desire to know and, and, and understand where our roots are. And I think that all, that all has to do with evolution of belonging and knowing your community and being a part of something that's all human nature in all aspects, for sure. So Africa is crazy because of how, of how large it really is. I had um, this guy on. He's an animator from, uh, he's from South Africa, but he's mm-hmm. very white. Sounds – okay. Now, I don't – I'm not a perfect person on accents, but he sounds British <laughs> in my mind. Yeah. Um, we were talking about a lot of stuff. We talked about um, uh, – different things that are going on in South Africa right now and uh, accents and things like that. And I was like, do you know that I'm American? He's like, of course I know you're American and everything like that. <laughs> and so, uh, um, but we talked about, I, I asked him a cool question. I asked him was, do you think what like, because South Africa is only like 9% white and but apart, apart, he said it was apartheid is how you really say apartheid. Yeah. Um, he was a, uh, I, but he, I asked him, so I was like, do you think that it is just as bad in America as um, just this racial discrimination and just like this feeling of different, you know? Um, and he was like, I think it's worse here. And that kind of blew my mind because, you know, as Americans, we're very, we live here, you know, we don't really only think about America and we only like, expe- unless you travel, you really only think about the States and everything. And it's cool to see like people understanding, like not understanding America's problems and everything, but like they have their own problems too. And like how self-centered we really are here and like mm-hmm. how like it'd be so much easier if like us is like, cause we actually like, not that we're um, like people aren't in poverty and everything, but like we're doing really well as like a country, like people are living better and everything like that. And if it'd be so much better if just we as people could just come together and realize that we have a lot of things that other people don't have, you know? And so that kind of blew my mind just to see that there are countries who are worse off than us money wise, who are having worse problems than us. And so yeah. that really got me thinking, you know? Yeah. And you think about it even from the social perspective, right? And I always, you know, especially with me, that, I love my experience being from Nigeria and Cameroon because it's given me the ability to go back home and spend a lot of time there. I, I lived there for four years when I was younger. Um, and I've been back multiple times to see family and different things like that. And the last time that I went back uh, a few years back, it is one of those things every time you go back is this reminder of how blessed you truly are. You know? And I remember going back to Cameroon uh, for a funeral. My uncle had passed away. And uh, it had been a long time since I'd been there before when I'd, when I'd gone to Nigeria before. And seeing my family out there and um, you know, having very little, right? And my family was, my family was in the village, the area, you, know, you, have, you, have, you have the main cities and everything like that. And my family was out in the village. So I'm talking, uh, you know, uh, not, not much electricity, not much access to electricity. We're still uh, bathing with buckets and rainwater um mud homes and different things like that we're in the village right and that experience itself is so unique because you realize just how privileged you are for all the little things that you have here just like electricity and access to running water things that we complain about you know first world problems as we say things we complain about all the time and yet you go over there and they're living their day-to-day lives going to school working doing everything that we, we normally do here and we complain about little things but all, of them, all these main things that they don't have access to, they don't even think about because they don't even have that access to even worry about it, you know? And it's one of those feelings you go back there and you have this, you, you, you have this importance, you have this, you come back with this understanding, this understanding about I am honored, I'm privileged to have everything that I have right here. And you see people having so little, but at the same time, they're so happy, right? I remember just watching like some of my cousins and kids that are running around playing and enjoying themselves. I'm like, these kids like some don't have shoes, don't have access to all these different things. They're, they're in that, they don't got cell phones. They don't, you know, just little things that we take for granted all the time. 
and they're still joyful. They still have this passion for life and seeing things and playing and being energized. And a lot of times I think that, that's why I always tell people, you know, if you have a chance to go to like a third world country, you know, to have that experience, it's important to do it because we need that as humans, especially as Americans here, because a lot of times you just don't realize how much we have until you go somewhere and you realize how little other people do, you know? No, yeah, that's, it really is an eye opener. And, and happiness is a weird one too, because happiness is like everyone says, or a lot of people say that happiness is like, you should live your life to be happy. But then you like, there's a rich family, his, a kid got his 16 year old, 17 year old got his second Lamborghini and he's not happy. And mm-hmm. you go to a third world country and he got some clean water and he's ecstatic. It's ecstatic. Yeah. <laughs> and so happiness is very relative. So I think, you know, the meaning comes within the social relationships between the people you have, you know, because you could be rich or you could be poor, but the one thing that changes is like the people around you, you know, mm-hmm. I've had this weird shift in my mind these last few few years. And one of them has been like, I realize I'm more happy. Like the happiest I am in situations is when the people that I love around me are having a better, like having a great time, you know? Yeah. And so yep. it's, it's scientifically, I don't like, that's got to be something evolutionary and like um, that comes from like wanting to be with the social pact and wanting them to survive like mm-hmm. um, like for your offspring and stuff. But it's just wild to think about how, you know, there's one thing that all humans share and it's love for other humans. You know, the, mm. the most evil person in the world, Hitler, let's go for Hitler. He had a wife and he loved her. You know, we could bet, <laughs> we could bet he loved her. Even if she it's was evil to about it, It's like, yeah, he yeah. loves somebody, yeah. his wife and his own people. maybe. <laughs> really? Yeah. And so it's, it's crazy. Really. It's really crazy to think that the one thing that humans really share is, is, is love for other humans. Mm. And so like, you know, me being, I would say I'm religious. I would like, I, I, I would say I'm Christian and everything. Um, but I also think scientifically and everything like that. And so I, re- but like, that's the thing that really gets me is like, that's where I become like more spiritual is when I start thinking about that, the idea of love and what love really is because love exists outside of humans. Like you could feel other people's love when you see it, you can, you know, there's just this, it's, there's, it's like, it's a being itself, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that's where, when you start looking at the happiness of other people or like the love for like, you can have the poorest family on earth and the richest family on earth, dad and mom. Okay. Not all the time, but the dad and mom, they have a son, dad, and mom, they have a son. Most of the time they love those things more than they love themselves. You know? Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. No, you're, no, you're hundred percent. Right. And I, and it, it's, it's interesting too, when you, when you, we tie it back to science, right. And you brought up the pack mentality, right. And, and, Let's just, let's just say humans, our closest relatives, right? chimpanzees and, and apes. You see organisms in the wild that either live in packs or live in groups, pride of lions, different things like that, right? You make those social connections uh, to us as humans. And things, simple things like, and I, and I touched a little bit about this in my biomimicry video, but simple things like uh, hunting or playing games, right? Like we're not the only organisms that play games, dolphins, you know, they play games with each other and, and toss fish around and, 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 and get high off puffer fish and stuff like that. They play games. Uh, elephants uh, play games. The youth play games with each other. They toss their tongues around. They dip themselves in mud. They splash, splash water at each other. And monkeys and uh, chimpanzees do that all too. And it's all part of this biological process of building social bonds and building these social connections. You're getting to know each other. You're expressing yourselves. And that's an important aspect of life. That's an important aspect of us as creatures in our natural world is wanting to be part of the community, wanting to have outlets to be able to express ourselves and showcase love. And you know, that, that's always that debate, right? Especially when you come to, you think about hunting and wildlife conservation and you know, do animals have feelings and all these different things like that. And, you, and there's always been these kind of debates about you know, what type of animal would have to do insects have feelings, you know, does this like kill this spider on my wall? Did, did, that, did I hurt that spider's feelings or, you know, that, and, and that's, that's could be all relative in a sense as well too. But as living organisms, we have this innate longing to either procreate, you know, the have sexual relationships and, and reproduce is the most natural instinct to, to do for any organism. That's a feeling, that's an emotion. If you wanna you know, if you, if you go in depth about that, you could break that, you could 
you know, argue on both sides, but, you know, wanting to, wanting to procreate and wanting to create babies could be a, a sexual feeling, all these different things, right? And, and I think it's important to look at all those aspects and look at those connections because it does help us understand each other better, understand, helps us understand why we do the certain things that we do, why we act a certain way. And especially right now in this pandemic stage, you know, we, we were talking earlier about um, uh, humans having a difficult time and, and things being relative as far as what we see as happiness and, and uh, comparing, you know, what's going on in South Africa to, you know, things happening here. You know, we, we've had a tough time getting through this pandemic. One, because we're so filled with pride and we, you know, we're so privileged to the point where things happen in us and our community and we're like, I know, I don't, I don't want to wear a mask because you're taking away my rights and blah, 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 or whatever, you know, and, and then even with racial justice and all these different things like that, and I was like, I don't believe in this. And be, be, because we have been in this space where we are so open to be able to do so many different things and what we want, you know, you go, you, you go to some other countries, you, some, some Asian countries, and you go to, you know, uh, North Korea or something like that, you can't, you can't have social media and be able to say whatever you want on your phone. You can't go to Google and just Google search whatever. If you go to China, you have restrictions on certain things you can do. Many, many different countries live with restrictions, you know, and, and they, they're not all dictatorship places or communist places. They're just places that have restrictions. I think one of my friends in Trinidad said right now in Trinidad, if you go there right now during this pandemic, they actually put a tracker on you so they know where you go and who you've been in contact with. And that the government just did that. Imagine if they try to do that here, how much uproar there'd be, you know, but it's because we're so, yeah, they're like, no way, you say, you, there's no way, like people would be out in the streets riding right now because of it. But uh, it's because we have all this access to different things and we have this privilege and this entitlement that we should be able to do whatever it is that we want to do. And in any aspect in life and in, 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 in intrinsic in, in biology, you have limitations. There are certain things you can, that you can, can't do, and that's just the way life is. And But we've evolved to this point where we feel and we, we're so entitled to have everything that we think we're beyond uh, uh, approach and we're beyond nature itself, which is pretty crazy. Yeah, one of the weirdest things that blows my mind about Americans right now is that the fact that we can be so privileged that we can protest whatever we want. But, realize, mm -hmm. but then when you when people are like, all right, well, let's sit down, two people who disagree, and let's have a conversation because that's what we have to do. At least the leaders, you know, mm -hmm. they're like, no, that guy's an idiot. It's like, dude, yeah. <laughs> you're literally allowed to walk down marching, yelling things that you believe in. Mm -hmm. You can do that. We can sit down and have a we can sit down and have a conversation. Yeah, and debate and have and, yeah. and be open and listen to both sides. You know, and, I, yeah. and a lot of times that's the, that, that's really the simple problem because it's it's like any relationship. You know, what I'm saying if I'm going through stuff with my wife, I we got to we got to sit down and have a conversation. If you're going through something with your girl, you got to sit down. And you can't just be like, nope, I'm not going to listen to what you have to say or, or think about your feelings. No, you the relationship is going to be over. Right? You have to have a sit down talk. Be open, yeah. honest accept what you may be doing wrong, which you might not be bringing to the table or holding up on your end, and mm -hmm. then work to get to a similar point, you know? And if we have that understanding when it comes to just us in general socially, there's so many different things that we can get through, you know, that dealing with politics and, and, every, and all the other BS that we got going on right mm -hmm. now. If we just listen to our human nature as, as people and, 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 and have this better understanding of how we have to work through things, we could solve so many different problems that are happening. That, imagine saying that to your 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 wife or my girlfriend, being like, "I don't want to listen to your feelings. Your feelings are wrong." <laughs> yeah, <you're, laughs> imagine how that would go. I'd be I'd be on this couch. I'd be on this yeah. couch for the rest of the, the rest couch. Of the week. Couch is the best the best example of what could happen. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah and, and like I always think about that. Like, like that's the thing you should think about is like when you're talking to when like you're like arguing with someone we should just pull like when people are having a debate in the house of representatives we should be like imagine saying this to your significant other being like mm -hmm. you you're stupid you're an idiot w w would you be sleeping in that bed tonight yeah. <laughs> no no not at all not no. at all and it's really that it's it's really that simple in so many aspects you know that i think yeah and you know I was tying everything back to science i think that's 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 why looking at scientific reason even even just not even science, but just philosophically right and making connections through things. So many things can be broken down so simply. We, you know, we've evolved to be so complex and there's, you know, we got technology and all these crazy advancements and, 
Like, shoot, I'm, I'm here talking on video chat to you. But if you told somebody what we're doing right now, 50 years ago, you know what I'm saying? That like, hey, I could communicate with you through my phone, through my and, and, and we're having a conversation and you're doing stuff or we have Bluetooth technology and I can listen to stuff wirelessly. People would be like, what? Right? Because we, we've gotten so complex with everything that we have in life and access to everything that we've made even our most basic fundamental things and how we navigate the world around us more complex than it needs to be. A lot of times it's just very, very simple methods to overcoming all the different challenges that we have. Couldn't have put it better. Um, here's a question I have for you. Do you have any crazy facts about the ocean? Ooh, about the ocean. Mm. I, I, do, I do love the ocean. The ocean is one of the things that, that really fascinates me. Um, I just had a conversation recently with somebody the other day. They're like, would you, if you had the option to uh, explore the deep ocean or, or deep space, which would you rather do? And I said the deep ocean. Uh, one, because you know, we know less about the ocean than we do about deep space, right? There's only about, uh, there's only about maybe like 65 or 70% of the ocean that we've actually like truly mapped out and explored. Um, and obviously there's tons of areas of space that we haven't explored by, you know, obviously by any means you can, you can make a legitimate argument about, you know, what we don't know about space, right? We don't know if there aliens exist in some exoplanet, you know, a million light, light years away or whatever. But we at least have an understanding about the massiveness of space and the far reaches of space and that there are stars and we can see things, you can see stars the light years away and all these different things. But the, the fact that our ocean is literally in our backyard, you know, here in Los Angeles, the ocean is literally in our backyard. You can go to the ocean every day and explore and navigate it. And we have these different tools to be able to explore, but we have yet to even know what's right here. That, that blows my mind. That's just so fascinating to me. Um, and uh, so to so think about like wild, uh, different wild, I'm actually going to go on a, an exploration trip uh, this coming summer uh, with this program called Ocean Exploration Trust. I won this uh, fellowship uh, and I was supposed to go on it this summer, but obviously with everything happening with the pandemic, the exploration had to get canceled. It was supposed to happen back in August, uh, but I'm going to be part of the Nautilus Live crew and we got access to a couple of different ocean vessels uh, that we can do uh, uh, different ocean studies. And we're gonna, I'm not sure exactly where our trip is gonna be, but it's probably gonna be somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. But we're gonna do research on the vessel. Uh, we're gonna relay uh, the work that we're doing out there on the deep sea to different classrooms and have different live events and stuff going on there. And I'm gonna be part of the science communication crew talking about stuff. So I'm really excited to learn a lot more during that trip. Uh, but ocean wildlife always fascinates me. You know, the, uh, like hearing creatures, but hearing like diff the different things about organisms, uh, lobsters that, that, that pee from their face, you know. Um, lobsters <laughs> I don't know what you just said. Lobsters <laughs> pee from their face? <laughs> yeah. Lo lo do you know lo lobsters' kidneys are located in their forehead? And so they actually urinate from their face. So their, their orifice that they use to pee is actually located at the top of their head, uh, which, which is pretty crazy. I did, a, I did this little TikTok video uh, breaking down lobster pee and, 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 and imagining, imagining if, you're, if your waist <laughs> orifice was located on your forehead, you know, what, what type of life would be leading, right? If we all walked around pissing yeah. out of our foreheads. It reminds me of Scary Movie 3 when the aliens are pissing out of their fingers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly uh, and that that's all yeah stuff like wildlife facts like that are always always pretty crazy to me um brine pools are crazy in the deep ocean uh yeah what is that you have brine pools you have these underwater uh you basically in some areas you actually have these underwater salt lakes these salt pools in this area of the ocean where the salinity in the water is much higher than the rest of the water, right? So you have all oceans are salt water, uh, but they're in certain areas, you have pockets of like pools of water um, that are located on the ocean floor uh, where the, it just has a higher concentration of salt. The salinity is way higher. Sometimes it could be 90% uh, higher than the rest of the ocean. Um, and it's a unique climate in there because organisms can't live within that area, right? So yeah, this whole kind of, and it's, and a lot of times it can be very, really, really deep. It could be at the bottom of the ocean. It could be, you know, it could be a mile or plus deep 
of this brine pool. And sometimes you have some certain organisms that have been adapted to be able to live around the surface that can kind of dip inside the brine pool for certain amounts of time and come back up. But it creates this really unique habitat where organisms live right on that threshold of this area that has high salinity. Um, and that's a pretty, pretty cool area because they're still trying to explore and see what's actually underneath those brine pools. Having access to explore down there in deep sea vessels is a little difficult. Um, but uh, that, that always fascinates me, a, a, literally a body of water inside another body of water that's completely separated, which is pretty dope. So obviously you're not an expert on this because you've never been, hopefully you've never been sunken in a ship underwater. But, um, <laughs> no, not yet. But hopefully, not how hopefully. long do you think you could survive underwater if you had a pocket of air and it never filled up? You know, there's, there was actually somebody sent me, somebody sent me something. I can't remember who, who. it was one, one of my, I have all these random group chats, right? I don't know about you, but I'm like on like, you know, like 10 different group feeds with different friends. Some of them are, are way too graphic to talk about. We just share whatever random stuff uh, or fun facts or doing social media stuff that's going on. But uh, somebody shared one in me. Those it happened recently, I think. Uh, it, it, was, it was off the shores of somewhere in Africa, but some ship capsized and, and, su and sank. And there was a guy that stayed under there. I believe he was there for three days. Yeah, yeah, I heard this. Yeah, he was, he was there. It was, I think it was a Nigerian man, actually. And he was inside this capsized ship underwater for three days. A rescue team eventually came down there and actually just came across. Uh, hit the, I think the rescue team was exploring the, uh, the ocean vessel, uh, looking for bodies or, you know, or whatnot. And they actually heard a sound and they found him. And he had been living in this pocket of air underneath there for about three days, if I remember correctly. And, you know, I know you can go three days without water. Uh, so I'm assuming that you, you know, you'd be limited, not just by the air, but by, <laughs> but by just, you know, dying of, of, of not being able to drink. Um, but yeah, I, I at least know you can do for three days just because I've seen the story. So I'd say a minimum of three days, it'd be a miracle if you survive longer than that sitting in a pocket of air stuck under salt water because you ain't drinking the salt yeah. water because you're going to dehydrate more. So, but that would be a crazy experience. Like completely, can you imagine yourself in pitch darkness knowing you're underneath the ocean nobody knows that you're there and you're just sitting here in this pocket of air just kind of submerged just like i hope somebody comes across here but yeah that's like one of those crazy. things where you're like everyone else around you die and you're like why did i have to survive now yeah. i die. Now, now i'm gonna have to die by some other way yeah right i'm gonna, I'm gonna be here by my and those are those are places those are times when like you, you could i don't know buddy i don't know but it, I'd be going through all sorts of random thoughts in my head of like, what could happen? And like, am I going to like, watch what's underneath? Die? Yeah. What's underneath me? You're just thinking about crazy. I remember that one story, they made a movie about it. Um, um, I can't remember the actor. Uh, I think it was James Franco. He was 127 movie. hours. Yeah. Where he got caught in the Canyon. Yeah. And he had to cut off his arm. Yeah. Yeah. That was crazy to me because that, because not only one, you're stuck in this canyon, you know, nobody knows you're here. Nobody is looking for you, right? So it gets to a certain point where you have to make a decision. It's like, I'm either gonna die of starvation because I can't eat anything. I can't, I have no access to water or I have to cut off my own arm. And you have to get to a really dire situation point where you're like, this is the executive decision I gotta make. I gotta literally cut through my own arm, saw through my own arm or just sit here and die. And I know a lot of people that would probably be like, I just sit there and die. There's no way I'm cutting off my own arm. And you never really know until you're in that position. You don't know until you're like literally at that life or death moment where you're like, I got to make a choice. <laughs> yeah, I always think about those survival shows and everything. In that movie, 127 Hours, it's like, what would I do when, if I was in those situations? Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. I don't think, and I don't think you ever ask, like anybody that says, oh, yeah, I definitely do. That. You know, you don't know because of that. Yeah. I can only imagine there's a whole nother level of survival mode that you get to when you're in that point. It's easy to say right now as I'm living and I'm comfortable, like, oh yeah, I chop up my own arm and be like, yeah, I don't know. But when you're at that point, you really got to yeah. make that decision. Are you going to really chop off your arm? Or are you going to sit there and let yourself die? Like, what are you going to do? I think there was another story too of this guy that got stuck in an avalanche. Um, and or like, he got in an avalanche and like he broke both of his legs. He had like cracked ribs. Uh, one of his arms was broken and he was like 17 miles away from the closest 
uh, uh, the closest shelter point. And he literally like crawled his way. Like, I think it was like, I want to say it was 17 miles back to like, he, he got obviously had frostbite and all these different things, but he had this, un, he had this will to survive. And, you know, their potential for like, uh, uh, I think he had, I think he got like approached by like wolves and had like fend off wolves and just like this crazy story. And you just think about that ultimate survival mode. Like, what does it take to actually be able to survive? And would you actually have the will to do it? I think that's always crazy to me. Humans are fascinating. Like, just like the stories you'll come across on like Snapchat previews and be like, guy survives three days after plane crash by killing eight wolves. You're like, yeah, <laughs> this deserves a little bit more than a Snapchat preview, my guy. <laughs> Seriously. Like, that's epic, man. Like, that's epic. And that's yeah. another tie back to just you know, human nature and survival. Yeah. It's like every organism has to find a way to survive. It doesn't matter if you're a gazelle that's that's roaming the African plains and you got a pack of, you got a pride of lions coming after you and you got to think of how best to escape this scenario is life or death. Organisms face threats every day and it's what do you do when you're faced with that threat, you know? And and that's when your true animalistic instinct shines through because we we are all fundamentally tied in nature and we're going to make fundamental animalistic decisions when it comes that time. So do you think it'd be scarier to get dropped in the middle of the Pacific Ocean at night by yourself? Well, like in like a raft or to be floating away from the earth by yourself in space? Ooh. I, would, I would say floating away in space by yourself because there's, there's zero hope, right? Like there's like like there's there's no you know this ain't this ain't armageddon they ain't gonna like put some ragtag group together in two days and fly up there and, and pick you up you know uh th- th- there's there's no getting to you you're done you're like you're you're gone <laughs> you're, you're 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 gone at least there's hope if you're in the ocean you might be in the middle of the ocean but who knows there might be some random plane coming by there might be some random ship that comes by who knows how far away you are or how close you are to land you might eventually float you might be able to catch a fish with your bare hands and you know then eat it raw whatever you who knows you but you at least have some semblance of hope of being able to survive that experience whereas when you're in space that's a wrap there's there's nobody coming for you there's no planet that you're going to land on that you're going to you know face survival it's a wrap for you you're done so i'd, I'd much rather be dropped in a, in a raft in the middle of the ocean for sure I think I'd rather be in space. Just you rather be like, in space? Just well, not because I know, I'm probably gonna die both places. The cool thing about <laughs> space is if I'm floating away, maybe an alien will find my body, body. <laughs> and then I'll be the first. Then I'll be the first human to be found by aliens. That'd be cool. Well, only, actually, only if humans knew about it. We we still don't know about aliens, right? So then yeah. they they ain't gonna be like, hey, we found one of your guys. We're bringing him back to you. Like, <laughs> Found one of your guys. Could you imagine? That's how you meet humans. They bring you like, down. <laughs> Here's your guy. Like that guy's dead. You're like, right? Hey. And you already know, out of the finger. Right? And you already know you ain't surviving mm. more than three days. And it's gonna take you longer than three days to float to whatever space area of space that some aliens are gonna find you. Because if you haven't found aliens anywhere now, they ain't gonna find you in three days. So <laughs> wherever you're floating to. There's no hope. We've already explored this, this, at least this solar system. We know, we, we know of right now uh, the, to where you're going to be able to reach within three days. So at least in a raft, I got some hope and I'm all about hope. You give me a, mm-hmm. give me a little bit of hope. I feel like I could at least endure for some time for three would, days, at least for sure. What would your first instinct be? If you say you were just walking down the street one day and did you watch the movie soul? I haven't seen it. The, the, the new, that new Pixar movie. Yeah. Watch it. I haven't seen it. Not going to give anything away, but what would your first instinct be if you like were walking and you like, I don't know, fell down a pothole and like just were in an alien galaxy and like around just aliens who could like translate what they were saying, what you were saying, you could communicate with them. What would you communicate? What would your first instinct be? My first instinct. Well, after, uh, after being like, what the, the hell that I just getting myself into. Uh, well, if we could communicate, like my, my first day would be like, y'all been living underneath the earth this entire time and we didn't know about it. We've been out here searching the far reaches of space 
for organisms for for aliens and you guys have been literally it's like what was that movie was that war of the worlds where the aliens were had been underground the entire time uh um, it's like you've, you've been living underneath the earth and all it took was me falling down a, a sewer hole <laughs> to, to discover you. That'd be my first thought was disappointment in ourselves that we've been looking in the wrong place forever. But, uh, but, but, but don't you think about community, we know we talk about this biological connection. I think communication would be the, the first key, understanding, okay, first, how are y'all living down here? How, how have you guys been surviving with no sunlight? No access to like what are you guys eating? What nutrients are you guys getting? <laughs> what are you getting? Like all that random stuff. I want to know. I'd be I'd be grilling them with all sorts of different questions. That'd be my first. That'd be my first thought because I want to know exactly how you guys function down here and how did we not know about you? <laughs> I think my first thing would be. Well, after what the hell am I doing here? Be like. <laughs> Do you, I don't know. Oh, that's a, that's a, I'd probably try to talk to them and just like try to figure out like how they're living and things like that. And the final thing I would do though, I know what the final thing I would do is find out if they have any energy sources that we don't know about Mm -hmm. that I could bring back and sell the idea and get a lot of money for. Yeah. (laughs) That see that now you're thinking like an entrepreneur. That's yes. That's (laughs) because they have to be living down. They have to be, having access to some sort of energy in order to be living underground and not for, for us to not know about it. So that, but that's, a, that brings up an interesting question then. Do you, do you keep that knowledge to yourself mm. and, and come back up and bring all these different things that you've learned to the surface world? Or do you, or do you tell somebody, do you share this new found science with the rest of the world? That's, that's another, that's, that's a question right there. I wouldn't share that there's aliens underneath in the pothole to the world, but I would share that there's the, a new energy source that as long as it's like better than the ones we have, like if it's like uranium nuclear power and it just gives radiation to everyone, but like aliens can live with that. We're not using that. But, mm-hmm. but if it was like some crazy anti-gravity machine that sucks in whatever and creates this energy that can warp time and speed dude i'm doing it because i want to meet other aliens <laughs> now it's now it's now we're like get rid of those guys those pothole mm-hmm. guys we're gonna find other ones mm-hmm. well then well then it takes you to this it takes you to the the moral aspect of science right because when you when you look at science you always have to think morally right because yeah. it's our duty as scientists to be able to make sure that we make these decisions that impact the world, right? And that's, you know, that's why we, we you know, people not get political, but, you know, people look at Trump, it's like, oh, you knew about this coronavirus all this mm-hmm. time, and you didn't tell us, you didn't warn us, we could have been, you know, we could have prepared for this better, different things like that. When you have the knowledge about science and how something could spread and how it could impact the world, it is, we do have a moral responsibility to inform others. Mm-hmm. I think we'd, we'd all probably be disappointed in the government right now if we actually found out that Area 51 was a real thing and that we had alien ships all this time and that we've been using alien technology to create Bluetooth and all these other things that we had. We There'd probably be an, a public uproar, like the government has been hiding this. And I mean, we already think they, we already assume that they are and hiding different things like that. But imagine if you really do find out and the facts come out, you know, you, you'd be disappointed because as people, we feel the, this knowledge needs to be shared. And it's like, does that actually benefit the greater good if you come back to the service world and you inform them of what's going on? Or does it actually better the greater good by not telling them because we know how we as humans are going to act if we find out that there are aliens living underneath us, like the government, you know, war, utilizing them for, you know, devious purposes or whatever, racial components, like do we find a way to build a wall so these aliens don't come up out of the dirt whatever it may be you know now there's just that negative aspect of mm-hmm. knowing right so there's there's you could look at you could look at uh positive and negatives on on both at on both sides of the moral spectrum okay final question before we're done here if you had three wishes from a genie what would they be oh the wish question oh god and you can't and you can't wish for more wishes right <laughs> no you can't wish for more wishes <laughs> That's the number one rule. <laughs> have you have you seen have you seen the new Wonder Woman? We're watching it tonight. Oh, okay, okay, I wouldn't give away anything. Then. Um, all right, that's not, I guess if that's the number. One. I, I, to me, that's always a dumb though. Like it's it, it's just the number one rule because of Aladdin. Like simply, it was Aladdin the first time that anybody said, "Oh, you can you have a genie and you can make a wish." I don't think a, I don't think a genie the concept of a genie 
only came about is like we've had concepts of genies yeah. for generations so but why is it that we go off the rule that was set in aladdin is that our is that the basis of all criteria <laughs> for making wishes is the movie aladdin <laughs> yeah aladdin yeah that's probably where it's from but it's a good rule to have because it makes you really think about what like you like you want you know mm -hmm. yeah that's true that's true uh that's always a tough one man because because you you because you, you can be critic you you'll be you get criticized for for not making some certain wishes and then others you know um i'll 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 i'll, I'll say i'll say this and, I, and i'll try to touch i'll try to touch selfish reasons and non-selfish <laughs> it's some so so i can't make them equal because i only got three so uh I, i'll do i'll do yeah well okay um it's always a tough one well they say well they always say money isn't the root of happiness but i always think that's because a lot of people don't a lot of people rely on money to be happy and you wanting you wanting a ridiculous amount of wealth doesn't isn't it uh isn't gonna make you unhappy you have to understand what the purpose of money is and how to actually drive it and i tell you right that if i had a if i had a if i had a if I had the ability to secure some bags right now, I'd be a happy ass man. Bro, right? I'm securing them bags. <laughs> yeah, I'd be a happy ass man. So I would secure uh, the bag first and foremost. I would get generational wealth. Okay. I don't even whatever number, X amount of number, I'm on generational wealth that could sustain my lineage. <laughs> first and foremost. All right. So I'm comfortable. That's my foundation. I can do whatever I, I want with my generational wealth um and then uh i don't know what comes after that like that's such a tough that's such a tough okay I'll do, i did my first one you go ahead and do your your second one not your first not think about mine my first one um i think for my first one i would i don't want to go money because that's a good one but i'm not going to do that i'm going to go that i I know what is at, I know, no, that's not a good one either. Cause I don't know. I don't think I want to know what happens at the end of the universe. I'm going <laughs> to go that having some clarity that when like my loved ones die, that they'll be in a better place. So not yeah. that I necessarily know where I, where we go, where we die, but just having some clarity about where you go. Well, just my loved ones, like that, the ones who have already passed away that they're in a better place. Just like feeling like more comfortable about those ideas while I live, you know? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. You went, you went, you got, you went, you went, you went a little empathetic and sympathetic. Okay. All just right. for my first one. Just for, <laughs> just for, <laughs> um, I would say I, I want, cause you know, just we're, we're talking about science and, and we, you know, and, and I guess as a science communicator and talking about education and, and all these different things, um, I would, I would love, I'll, I'll, I'll make one kind of empathetic, uh, correlation to the, the field that I'm in. Um, I'd want, I want better. I want access. I want everybody, I want enable access, um, to education to everybody. Yeah, and I'm talking. I'm talking about like globally, right? So people that in areas that have limited access, no education to teaching or tools or Wi-Fi, different things like that. Simple things that you need to be able to learn uh, and be able to have a better understanding and have access to opportunities. I want to enable equal opportunity to the globe, globally. My second one is going to be, I want to be able to swallow book inf like informations in books like this in a blink of an eye. Like you just touch it. And yeah. You, and you, and you know, that's yep. a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. Ooh. And I'll say my last three, I want teleconnected powers. I want to be able to, I, that's because people always ask about superpowers, right? And so a lot of people are like, I want to fly, like fly is cool, but like, uh, if you could control anything, <laughs> you could control anything by just sitting there with hands and just move things around. I'd rather I'd, I'd rather rather do that than fly because I feel that that's way more convenient, right? Because I you know eventually I could get to something. But if I if I could just move things around with my mind, 
that'd be that'd be that'd be that'd be dope. So, that's a good one. That, that's a good one. My final one would probably be that I if I could interdimensional travel. But is it a good one though? Because that's assuming that there are other dimensions. Well, we already know that. What if you what if you make your wish? I wish I could enter the bank chat and nothing happens because there's no actual other dimensions to go to. Then you just wasted a whole wish. Time travel, then. <laughs> time travel. Travel back in time and, in and the forward. Future. Yeah. Okay. But be able to like go wherever I want and just see things. Mm-hmm. Where though? Where would you go first? Where would be the first place you go? I want to see my dad as a kid. Mm-hmm. That's, That's a good one. Probably be the first one, just because like, I got you know you never get to see like your parents as like children. So like yeah, to be able to see them like at your age in the in their moment. Yeah. yeah. I tr- I I travel back to uh, the age of the dinosaurs because I, I just want to get a snapshot. I just want to be dropped into literally Jurassic Park 65 million years ago and just and just see what did this world like in the exact same spot that I'm in right now. What did this look like 65 million years ago? And just just browse around, right? That that'd be because there's so much that we don't know, right? Just get that visual aspect of like, oh, this is what it's like. That would be dope. Well, that's a good way to end it. Thank you for being here. Yeah, man. No, thanks for having me, man. This is dope. I lo- I love being able to go off the cuff and just talk yeah. about random things. And you know, yeah. I, I think I think we kept it scientific. We did, yeah. Because <laughs> we didn't. It was, it's just <laughs> um. Just you want to like not? I mean, I, I I always tell my guests before they leave they can just plug themselves, just talk about you and your little brand before you go. Yeah, um, yeah. If anybody wants to find uh, my content, my work, you can check out my website, hiphopscienceshow.com. Um, I got pretty much all my content and links there as well. Uh, my YouTube and Instagram channels are all at Hip Hop Science Show. Uh, you can't miss me. I'm usually in my white lab coat, Hip Hop MD title on there my headphones, glasses, hard to miss. Um, a lot of dope stuff coming up this year. Uh, I don't think I mentioned this, but you know, my, really one of my big goals with this platform is, and as an entertainer is I want to be able to develop this platform into a show. So I'm thinking, you know, like, you know, until we talk about the comparison to Bill Nye, I want, I want my own show. So I'm willing that to existence uh, this year. So got some pretty cool things in the works to try to make that happen. Um, and then bringing some more science to the masses and, and, and making science dope. So, uh, so a lot of cool things uh, bubbling up this year, and I'm really excited about 2021. Again, thank you for coming on. This was a lot of fun. Um, I'll definitely keep you updated because it'd be, it would be fun to have you on again. Um, and if you're ever in the Portland area in person. Yeah, too, so. yeah most definitely. Most definitely, yeah. No, let's, keep, let's keep in touch for sure. Thank you. Thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. See you.